My name is Cicely Muldoon. I'm the acting superintendent here at Golden Gate. But what I'm really here to do is what you all want to hear. I'm about to introduce one of the biggest conservation heroes this planet has ever seen. We are all so lucky today to have Dr. Jane Goodall here in this national park. And we're so excited to have Roots and Shoots. Are you ready? Okay, I'll stop talking now. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jane Goodall to the stage. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Jane. Are you having fun? Yes. Yeah. Did you have fun doing your projects? Yes. Yeah. Are you going to carry on doing your projects? Yes. Yeah. Are you going to talk to all the other groups of Roots and Shoots who are here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I am very excited. I went round your projects. I wish I could have spent much, much longer with each of the projects, but at least I got to see all of them and the amazing things that you're doing to make this a better world. And isn't it exciting to know that in 100 countries, we have young people like you caring about the environment, caring about animals, caring about people, all part of Roots and Shoots. Isn't that exciting? Yes. yes. And yeah, you can, you know, it's, it's really, for me, it's very, very exciting. But I'm going to start off. I know there are people here speaking different languages. And if we hear our own language, we answer, right? So if I say, good morning, you say? Good morning. And if I say, bonjour? Bonjour. Good morgen. Good morgen. One in Swahili. Jumbo. Jumbo. And now, listen carefully because you're going to reply. <laughs> right. A whole forest full of chimpanzees that makes me feel homesick, you know, but I'm going to spend just a few moments telling you how I got to do what I've done and why I'm doing what I do now. So you have to come back and imagine Dr. Jane as a little girl growing up in England. 83 years ago I was born. I've walked on this planet for 83 years. And so during the time I've walked on this planet, I've seen so much change. I bet some of you, can you imagine a world without TV? A world without video games? A world without aeroplanes flying back and forth? I bet you can't. <laughs> anyway, when I was little, I loved animals. Lots of you love animals, I know, because you've been telling me and I've seen some of your projects. And so when I was just one and a half years old, just a little squiggly thing, my poor mother came into my bedroom and she found I'd taken a whole handful of wriggling earthworms to bed with me. So lots of mothers would get angry, right? Throw those dirty things out. But my mother said very quietly, Jane, if you leave them here, they'll die because they need the earth. And so we took them back into the garden. And then a story that some of you know, but I'm going to tell it again for a special reason. And this was when I was four years old, and we lived in London in the city, and there's not many animals in London. And then my mother took me for a holiday, a magical holiday, onto a farm in the country. And there, for the first time, I met animals wandering about in the fields. No horrible, cruel, intensive factory farms for animals back in those days. And I was given a job to help collect the hen's eggs. So I was going round. There were about six of these little wooden hen houses where they slept at night. 
and I was collecting the eggs. And apparently, I don't remember this, but, you know, here's an egg about so big, right? You all know what a chicken egg looks like. And I was asking people, but where on the chicken is the hole where the egg comes out? Because I couldn't see a hole like that. And obviously nobody told me. So what I remember is seeing this hen. She was brown. And she was going into a hen house. And I must have thought, ah, she's going to lay an egg. And I crawled after her. And I still remember her squawks as she flew out. What a frightening thing for her. And so... I went into an empty hen house and waited because now, now I'm on the road of discovery. Now I'm going to find out for myself how a chicken lays an egg and where the egg comes out. So I hid in a corner and I waited and I waited and I waited, which is fine for me, but my poor mother didn't know where I was. So she was out searching, everybody was searching and Yet, after four hours, when she saw me rushing towards the house, instead of getting angry, how dare you go off without telling us, don't you know how worried you've made us? She saw my shining eyes of discovery and sat down to hear the wonderful story of how a hen lays an egg. So if you think about that story, isn't that the making of a little scientist? Curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer, and here's the thing, deciding to find out for yourself, but making a mistake, but not giving up, and learning patience. You see, it was all there in that little four-year-old child, and a different kind of mother might have crushed that early scientific curiosity, and I might not have done what I've done. As it was, she found books for me about animals, thinking I would learn to read more quickly. And I discovered Dr. Doolittle when I was eight years old. And if you haven't read the Dr. Doolittle books, please do, because they're wonderful. And then when I was 10 years old, I discovered a little book called Tarzan of the Apes. And I just had enough money saved up to buy it. We didn't have much money at all. And I took it home and I fell passionately in love with this glorious Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. And you all know about Tarzan because you've seen him on television. But I hadn't. I just had my imagination, my imagined Tarzan from the book. And how jealous I was because he married Jane, but he married the wrong Jane. It wasn't me. <laughs> that was when I decided I'm going to grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. And everybody laughed at me. How will you get to Africa? It's very far away. We don't know much about it. It's dangerous. It's full of dangerous wild animals. And you don't have any money. And you're just a girl. So you haven't any hope of getting to Africa, they said. But not my mother. And what my mother said to me is what I'm going to say to you. And it's what Roots and Shoots is telling children all around the world. If there's something you really want, you're going to have to work hard and take advantage of opportunities. And most important of all, don't give up. So that's the message I take around the world. And it was the message my mother gave to me. So, okay, I learned about animals. I was very good at school, but we didn't have money for university. And I got a job, a boring old job. And then I got a letter from a school friend inviting me to Kenya in Africa for a holiday. So that was the opportunity. And in order to get there for that holiday, I had to work very hard as a waitress for about four or five months. And finally, I got to stay with my friend in Kenya. And then I heard about a man called Dr. Lewis Leakey. And somebody said, Jane, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Lewis. And so I went to meet him at the Natural History Museum, and he took me all around, and he asked me so many questions about the animals that were there. And luckily, I'd followed my mother's advice. I read every book I could find about animals in Africa, and so I could answer most of his questions. And that's why he offered me this amazing opportunity 
of going to live with and learn from not any old animal but the one most like us the chimpanzee big problem when i first got there was that they ran away as soon as they saw me they'd never seen a white ape before <laughs> and that's exactly what i was and i really worried we only had money for six months and after a few weeks and then a couple of months and then three months four months I still wasn't close enough to get to really know them. But luckily one of them, whom I named David Greybeard, lost his fear before the others. And it was David Greybeard that I saw one special magical day sitting on a termite mound and using pieces of grass as tools and breaking off leafy twigs and stripping the leaves to make tools. And if you saw that today, it wouldn't be particularly exciting. But back then it was because it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools. And that's when the National Geographic Society came into the picture. They agreed when the six months money ran out that they would continue to fund my research. Meanwhile, David Greybeard was helping me to get to know the other chimps because if he was with a group, and they were ready to run away and he just sat there calmly, they must have decided, well, she's not so scary after all. And so I got to know his friends in the forest, Goliath, his best friend, who was the top ranking male, and Mike, who eventually took over, and old female Flo, that wonderful mother, who was about f over 40 years old, but she was the dominant female, and she had an amazing family. And from her and the other females, I learned that in chimp society, there's good mothers and bad mothers, just like in our society. And Flo had a baby, and I was able to watch the gradual development of her infant. Well, my big problem back then was that because I'd never been to college, because I didn't have a degree, because I was just a woman, the scientific community just said, well, you don't have to believe anything she says. Just because she says chimpanzees use and make tools, probably she taught them. Actually, that would have been very clever if I could have done that. But anyway, um, and so how lucky it was that the National Geographic Society sent out a photographer and a filmmaker, a Dutchman, Hugo van Lauwek, and it was his films and his photographs back in the early 60s that documented that proving that what I'd said was true. And it was those geographic documentaries and still pictures in the magazines that took the story of Jane and the Chimps into the living rooms around America and then around the rest of the world. And Hugo became my husband as we together documented the chimpanzee research and we had a little baby who was nicknamed Grub, who is somewhere here, I'm not sure where, but somewhere. And Grub has a son, Merlin, who's also here somewhere. Oh, they're waving, they're down here, maybe you meet them later. You better stand up and wave so people can see you. There they are, Grub and Merlin. Okay, so anyway, back to my story. Now I began to learn about the chimpanzees how each one has a different personality. I began to learn more and more about how they're like us. They kiss, they embrace, they hold hands, they pat one another. When the males are competing for dominance, they swagger and look big and fierce and threatening. In fact, they behave like some of our human politicians. <laughs> and, and so, and I was learning about the importance of a long childhood because you know something? Chimpanzee children have to learn just like you do. They don't go to school. Their school is the forest. And they learn by watching the adults and imitating the behavior. And I was very shocked and very sad when I found that like us, they have a dark, aggressive side. They even have a kind of primitive war. But just like us, they also show love, compassion, 
and true altruism, true altruism as when a mother dies and she leaves a little three-year-old infant and he doesn't have a brother or sister who would look after him if he did. He was all alone in the world and to our amazement, a young adult male took, looked after him, carried him around, let him share his sleeping platform or nest at night, shared his food and protected him if he got into difficult situations and saved his life. And that's just one example. There are many, many examples like that. And so there I am learning more and more about the chimpanzees, living out in the rainforest, which I'd always wanted to do. And I know you were hearing about the rainforest early this morning. For me, it's a very spiritual place. I feel connected to an amazing tapestry of life where every little species has its own part to play in this amazing tapestry of life on this planet. And it was a wonderful time of my life. And then I got a letter from Louis Leakey telling me that if he was gone, if he was dead, he wouldn't be able to get money for me anymore and he was elderly by then. And so he said, Jane, you have to get a degree so people will listen to you and give you money. So he got me a place in Cambridge University. He said well, there was no time to do a, a BA. I just had to get a PhD, a doctoral. <laughs> and when I got to Cambridge, I was very scared. Can you imagine? I'd never been to college. I was just a girl. People weren't believing me. And now I'm going amongst all these very knowledgeable professors. Can you imagine what it felt like when they told me I had done everything wrong? They said, Jane, it's not scientific to give your animal subjects names. You should have given them numbers. Well, I wouldn't have remembered them if I had. <laughs> and then they said, you can't talk about chimpanzees having personalities. Only humans have personality. You can't talk about them having minds capable of thinking. Only humans can do that. And you're talking about them having emotions like happiness, sadness, fear, despair. You can't do that. That's not scientific. Only humans have emotions like that. Well, fortunately, fortunately, when I was a child, I had a wonderful teacher. And that teacher had taught me that at least in this respect, those professors were wrong that of course animals do have personalities, minds and feelings. And I wonder who that teacher was. That teacher was my dog. Oh. And if you share your life in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a guinea pig, um, a rat, they're very intelligent, a pig, I don't care what it is, you know of course animals have personalities, minds and feelings. If I had time, I could tell you so many amazing stories about animal intelligence. But you can just Google it and find out about the intelligence of many birds, the intelligence of the octopus, the intelligence of bumblebees, and even trees can communicate with scent and warn other trees if there's a swarm of caterpillars about to arrive. So it's a very wonderful world that we live in. And for any of you wanting to go and study nature, animals, birds, the environment, I think it's the most exciting time in all my 83 years. At any rate, uh, I did get my PhD. I did go back to Gombe. I did build up a research station. And they were the best days of my life. And out there in the forest every day. Grub was a little baby and so I was with him in the morning and with the chimps in the afternoon or the other way around, doesn't matter. And so why did I leave? Why did I leave that beautiful paradise, that wonderful forest, those amazing chimpanzees? I left because I realized back in 1986 at a big conference here in America that chimpanzee numbers right across Africa, and they only live in Africa, the numbers were dropping. They used to live in the forest in 25 different African countries. Today, they're still found in 21 countries, but the numbers in each country have dropped. 
and where the forest used to be connected, now there's little patches and each little patch is getting smaller because human populations are growing. And forests are being cut down by big corporations who go in to do mining or logging and all the time the habitat of the chimps is shrinking. And I learned too about the bushmeat trade, that's the commercial hunting of wild animals for food. It's very different from the subsistence hunting where you live in the forest and you shoot some animals in order to stay alive. This is shooting animals to sell them. And it was having a huge and damaging effect on chimpanzees, gorillas, and all the other animals living in the forest. And chimpanzees were being caught in wire snares set by hunters to catch food animals. And people were moving into the forest further and further with their cattle, destroying the forest, but also taking with them disease. And chimpanzees are so like us in their biology that they can catch our human diseases. And so when I left that conference, I was a changed person. I knew that I had to leave Gombe to try and do something to help the chimps across Africa. So I managed to get a little bit of money and I went to Africa and I went to seven of the countries where chimpanzees live and I learned a lot about what was happening to them. But I also learned a lot about what was happening to many of the African people living in and around chimpanzee habitat. I learned about the poverty, I learned about the hunger, I learned about the lack of good medical facilities, I learned about the lack of good education. And when I flew over Gombe National Park with the chimps, my chimps are, it's very small, it's only 30 square miles, that's tiny. And when I began in 1960, that little forest was part of a great big forest that stretched across Africa. When I flew over in 1990, it was a little, like an island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills. And there were more people living there than the land could support and they were too poor to buy food from elsewhere. They were struggling to survive. And that's when I realized if we want to protect nature and wildlife, we have to help the people. So now we have the Jane Goodall Institute with its Take Care to Kari program. We've improved the lives of people around Little Gombe National Park, but in six other African countries as well, around chimpanzee habitat. So if you fly over Gombe today, you won't see bare hills. The trees have come back. The people are our partners. They're helping us to conserve nature, not just for the chimpanzees, but for their own future. And so this is all requiring a lot of money. And I was traveling around the rest of the world, talking about the problems in Africa, but learning at the same time what we're doing to the planet. And you all know about that. I've been around all your projects, and I know that you know what we're doing to the planet. You know how we're polluting the environment. You know how waste plastic is killing animals in the ocean and everywhere else too, for that matter. You know about the greenhouse gases. You know about too much burning of fossil fuel. You know about the danger of fracking. You know so much now as young people. And, but back then we didn't know all these things. And all the time I was learning more and more and more about what we humans are doing to harm this planet. And I was meeting many young people who didn't seem to have much hope for the future. And some of them were angry, even violent, angry. Some of them were really depressed, really, really depressed. Most of them were just apathetic. Well, there's nothing we can do about it, so why bother? Well, I'm sure there are some young people here who believe that we have harmed your future. How many of you think that your future has been harmed by our generations? Yes, we have. 
and I expect you may have heard a saying, we haven't inherited the planet from our parents, we borrowed it from our children, but we haven't been borrowing your future, we've been stealing it. This is why I started Roots and Shoots, because I don't believe it's too late. I believe that we have a window of time. I believe that if we get together, we can start putting things right. That's what Roots and Shoots is all about. And it began with 12 high school students in Tanzania about 26 years ago. And it's now in 100 countries it's got about 100 to 150,000 active groups. And as you know, we've got members in kindergarten, uh, we've got members in university, and everything in between. And the main message is that every single one of us matters. Just like in the rainforest, every single one of us has some role to play in this complex life. And every single one of us makes some difference every single day. You cannot live through a day and not know uh, and, and not make some difference on the planet. And we have a choice. Do we want to make the place better or don't we care? And so, as you know, at least all the Roots and Shoots people know, we do projects to help people, to help animals, and to help the environment. And one thing that's been really, really important is that growing up in this movement that's now all around the world, there is a feeling we have somehow to break down the barriers that we're always building between people of different nations so that they start fighting each other, between people of different cultures, between people of different religions, and between us and the natural world. So Roots and Shoots is about inclusiveness, about bringing people together, about peace, about learning to live in peace and harmony with each other and the natural world. So I, I could talk to you for a very long time, but I'm going to tell you my reasons for hope. And I've got five reasons for hope, particularly important ones anyway. The first one is all of you. I mean, as I'm traveling 300 days a year all over the world, I meet groups like this, I go around projects like this everywhere in 100 countries. Think of it. What a difference you're making. Of course, this is my main reason for hope. And I found that everywhere, when you young people understand what the problems are, and we allow you to choose what you want to do, not what we tell you to do. What do you care about? What sort of project can you work out with your friends, with your parents, with your teacher? And so, of course, Roots and Shoots and other such groups are my main reason for hope for the future, because you are changing the world. And my second reason for hope is this amazing intellect we have. Do you know that's the one thing that makes us more different from any other animal, including chimps? This amazing intellect. Can you think how extraordinary it seems to me, who grew up before television, we've put people up on the moon. You just had a nearly full moon. I mean, like two days ago, it was three quarter, I think. And if you look up at the full moon, do you ever say to yourself, how weird, people have walked up there? I mean, it's pretty incredible, isn't it? And, you know, this, they designed a rocket that went all the way up to the planet Mars, and a little robot is still crawling around and taking photographs. And from those photographs, we see a dead, barren landscape. We don't want to go and live there. We don't want to live on the moon. And we've got just this one planet. So how is it possible that the most intellectual creature to ever walk on the planet is destroying its only home? It seems there's been a peculiar disconnect between the clever brain and the human heart and head and heart working in harmony. 
is what's going to heal the world. At least that's what I believe. So we are now using our brain to do wonderful things, technology, solar energy, wind energy, and all the other amazing inventions, but also in our own lives, how we can walk through life leaving a light ecological footprint and not start destroying the planet every single day. My next reason for hope is how amazing and forgiving nature is, how resilient places that we've completely destroyed, if we give them time, they can once again support life. There's projects here to clean up creeks and let the wildlife come back. You fly over Gombe now and there's no bare hills, the trees have come back, the animals have come back. I've seen projects like this all over the world and animals on the very brink of extinction have been given another chance because people like you care and say, no, we will not let them become extinct. I saw one project over there trying to save a plant that's on the brink of extinction. Plants matter too. We can't live without plants. Without plants, everything would die. So uh, uh, the resilience of nature is one of my reasons for hope. And then, you know, I only discovered recently social media. Social media can be used for very nasty purposes. We know that. There's a lot of rubbish out there on the internet. But at the same time, you know, for the first time in human history, if we care about something like climate change, we can bring together people from all over the world on one day to let their voices be heard, to march and say, no, we want to, we want to curtail the emissions. We want to do something about climate change. We do believe that we're harming the planet by burning fossil fuel and creating methane and so on. So uh, social media use right is a reason for hope. And then finally, the indomitable human spirit, the amazing people who tackle what seems to be impossible and won't give up and so often succeed. People who struggle with poverty and somehow come through and still smile. People who struggle with tremendous physical disabilities and won't give up and inspire others. And that's why I carry Mr. H with me. Mr. H was given to me by a man called Gary Horn 26 years ago. He thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee for my birthday. He's blind. I made him hold the tail. Gary, chimpanzees don't have tails. He said, never mind, take him where you go and you know my spirit's with you. Gary Horn, if he was standing here, you wouldn't know he was blind. And at the end of his show, because he's a, he taught himself to be a magician. Can you imagine a blind man who's a magician? Anyway, you don't know he's blind and then he tells you. And he says, you know, something might go in, wrong in your life because we never know, but if it does, don't give up, there's always a way forward. And he's just taught himself to paint. And if you're interested to see this amazing man, then his book is called Blind Artist by Gary Horn, and it's on Amazon. And there's a portrait that he painted of Mr. H, whom he's never seen, and he painted it just by feeling, and it's completely amazing. So this indomitable human spirit enables people and animals to survive terrible disadvantages and the setbacks that we encounter in life. And we know we're harming the planet. And we know there are people who don't care about the planet but only care about making money and more money and more money. It doesn't make you happy. But we've learned to think that success is money and power, money and power, money and power. And we don't think about success being getting just enough money to, to enjoy our lives, to have time with family and friends, to save nature so we can go out and be refreshed in the forest or the wetlands or wherever. So this indomitable spirit is something which to me 
is absolutely amazing. And I'm going to end with one story. And it's a story about a chimpanzee who was born in Africa. And his mother was shot when he was two years old. And he's, he was taken, stolen from his dead mother and sent off to America where he was going to be used in medical research because their bodies are so like ours. And for about 12 years, old, old man as he was called, he was called old man because a baby chimp who loses his mother, you've probably seen photographs, they just huddle up and they look like little old men, even though they're only babies. So old man was in some nasty medical experiments in a lab and then he was lucky because when he was about 13, 14, they decided they didn't want him anymore. And they gave him to a zoo, Lion Country Safari, and he was put on an island with three females, two from medical research, like old man, and one from a circus. And the training of circus chimps, entertainment chimps, is really cruel and horrible, and you don't want to learn about it, it's beastly. So a man was employed to look after these three chimps. And so he was told, don't go anywhere near them. They're stronger than you are. They hate people, they'll kill you. So Mark was throwing food onto the island from his little boat. And he, he watched them, you know, a baby was born. Old man had a baby. An old man loved this baby and he was so gentle and he protected this little little baby and carried him around and shared his food with him. And Mark felt, how can I care for these amazing beings if I don't have some kind of relationship with them? So he began going a little bit closer every day and one day he held out a banana and old man gently took it from his hand and he said Jane I know just how you felt when David Graybeard took his first banana from you and the females kept away but Mark was able to get onto the island and he was able to groom old man and one day old man turned around and groomed Mark and they began to play tickling and chimps are very ticklish and when they're when they're being tickled, they, ah, 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 they laugh. And so old man and Mark became friends and everything was fine until one day Mark slipped because it had been raining, it was muddy, he fell flat on his face, startled the infant who was nearby and the infant screamed. And so the mother immediately, as chimpanzee mothers will, raced over to protect her child from what she thought was danger and as Mark is still lying on the ground she bit into his neck and the other two females rushed over to help their friend one bit his wrist one bit his leg and then he looked up now he sees old man thundering across the island with his lips bunched in a furious skull his hair bristling and Mark thought he would die Oh, thought Mark, he thinks I've hurt his precious baby. But what happened? Old man pulled these three females off Mark as he lay on the ground. He managed to keep them away while Mark dragged himself to his little boat and safety. And I went to meet Mark when he came out of hospital. And he said, Jane, there's no question. Old man saved my life. And for me, this is a very symbolic story because if a chimpanzee and a chimpanzee who's been so terribly abused by humans can nevertheless defend a human friend in time of need, then how much more we, with our superior intellect, our greater ability to understand, how much more can we reach out to the animals and to other people? in their time of need. So I wanted to end with that story because I think it's, it's like a sort of symbolic roots and shoots story. Here we are with our amazing brains, with all the gifts that we've been given to use our lives to make this a better world for each other, for the other animals, and for the environment we all share. 
So my last word is to say thank you for all of you who've been doing these projects. They're wonderful projects. You can feel very proud of them. And because you're part of a program that's around the world, these projects will be shared by other young people just as you will share their projects. And together, together, we can make this a better world, yes? Yes. 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 Can we make this a better world? Yes. Will we make this a better world? Yes. So, thank you. <laughs>